it was the 1980s. Japan was ascendant, now firmly recovered from the all-encompassing disaster of World War II. A seemingly stable, true economic superpower, Japanese companies were buying up land and doing business across the world. And at the same time that Japan had so firmly cemented its place on the world stage, those ethnic Japanese communities of immigrants in far-flung areas of the globe who had left Japan during harder times now found their places in their adopted homes solidifying. In Brazil, over 17,000 kilometers away from the Japanese archipelago, the Japanese-Brazilian community was by now the largest community of ethnic Japanese outside of the homeland, and had seen its population stretching past a million individuals. The hardships and ethnic strife that had been the hallmarks of the first decades of the Japanese-Brazilian community's existence were fading into the background. In the southern Brazilian states of Sao Paulo, Parana, Minas Gerais, and the northeastern state of Pernambuco, the Japanese community was an established and major part of local society, as more and more ethnic Japanese intermarried into other local populations and their children interacted with and grew up in the wider Brazilian world exclusively in Portuguese, distant memories of a homeland in Japan became less defined, more blurred at the edges. Just as Japan itself was making itself known more forcefully than at any time in the past 35 years. One real estate company spent $1.3 billion on New York's landmark Rockefeller Center. Well, um, it's nothing new. Japanese are buying everything in New York City now. But um, I hope we could buy back a couple of companies in um, Japan. And it was at just this time that Japan, which less than a century earlier, had urged the poorer segments of its swollen rural population to leave their homes for the foreign shores of labor-starved Brazil, suddenly cast its eyes on South America for the first time in decades, and remembered its millions of prodigal sons and daughters living there. So what made Japan suddenly reach out to its seemingly long-forgotten overseas descendants? The story begins with Japan's calamitous fall and subsequent meteoric rise. Konnichiwa and hola mina. Welcome once again to Unseen Japan, your one-stop spot for Japanese news, history, and culture. As always, I'm Noah Oskow, and today we're continuing with the story of the world's largest overseas Japanese population, the Japanese Brazilians. Last time we covered the difficult but inspiring history of Japanese migration to Brazil in the early 20th century. This time the story reverses course with the large-scale return migration to Japan, which has made such a marked impact on the diversity of that country. While you don't need to have seen the previous episode to enjoy this tale of complicated cultural homecoming, it's still worth knowing about the history of this vibrant community before their return to Japan, so feel free to check out the first video. As always, I hope to do justice to the story of those about whom I'm speaking. If you're Japanese-Brazilian yourself, I'd love to hear your comments on these videos. And as always, if you enjoy this video, give us a like and subscribe, or maybe even support us over at Patreon. Anyway, once again, vamos começar, and sasoku hajimeyo, on with the show. The 20th century was a tumultuous one for the entire world, and Japan was, of course, no exception. The first five decades alone saw Japan's continued rapid modernization and emergence as a world power after its defeat of Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, the first time an Asian power had defeated a major modern European empire. Japan expanded its hold over vast areas of Asia and the Pacific in an often brutal colonization project. Its rise continued until its complete defeat at the end of World War II, which saw the destruction of 60% of its urban spaces and the loss of territorial sovereignty for seven years to an American occupation. At the end of these turbulent and violent 50 years, Japan was greatly diminished. Its economy and infrastructure destroyed, its place on the world stage diminished from imperial world power to conquered non-entity. For most of the occupation period spanning 1945 to 1952, Millions of Japanese lived in abject poverty, often struggling to find proper housing and work amidst the rubble of burnt-out buildings. Their only source of food and household goods were the black markets that often sprung up around major train stations. While some enterprising entrepreneurs, like 
Morito Akio and Iwasaki Minoru of the then nascent company Sony were already hard at work trying to find new ways to succeed in a shattered economy, the world as a whole now viewed Japan as a subdued manufacturer of mere cheap wooden knickknacks. But the 20th century was not one of complacent lulls, especially not in Japan. And it wasn't long before the intense poverty and social unrest of the 40s and 50s was trending towards a completely different direction, as what has come to be known as the Japanese economic miracle stuttered to life. Buoyed by concerted government initiatives and American aid aimed at propping up a strong capitalist ally against communism in the Pacific, the Japanese economy began surging in the mid-1950s. The Japanese people who only recently had to struggle to simply find rice to feed their families or to put a roof over their heads had almost overnight become middle class. Large corporations offered guaranteed lifetime employment with enviable benefits and a sense of security and expectations of a certain sort of lifestyle came into being. The economy continued to rise at an almost unbelievable rate, sending Japan into the stratosphere of international GDP rankings. Suddenly Japan had the second largest economy in the world. The international reach of Japanese businesses began to create images of a world beholden to Japanese economic might something reflected in contemporary fiction like Blade Runner or Michael Crichton's Rising Sun. Rising Sun. You ever negotiated with the Japanese before? Well, this is hardly a negotiation. What is it then? It's a homicide. A detective, an expert in ancient wisdom. Every aspect of your appearance and behavior will reflect on you and on me as your senpai. That wouldn't happen to be anything like Massa now, would it? A cop who learned his lessons on the street. Senpai, apple pie, whatever it is you want me to call you, we have a murder here. I want to solve it. You'll probably find them irritating tonight. Do keep your hands at your sides. The Japanese find big arm movements threatening. Believe it or not, I have done this before. You know, I do know these things. You come down already? Yeah? Well, now I go back up. Maybe come down, go up 10 times more. We're still the police in our own country. He's contaminating the crime scene. And I want his film. We must undertake our own private inquiry. It's a case they're not supposed to solve. From the number one. And later, even Die Hard. I want to congratulate each and every one of you for making this one of the greatest years in the history of the Nakatomi Corporation. Throw quite a party. I didn't realize they celebrated Christmas in Japan. I think we're flexible. Pearl Harbor didn't work out, so we got you with tape decks. But as early as the 1970s, all this prosperity was beginning to cause a bit of an ironic problem back in Japan. With so many Japanese lifted into the middle class, fewer and fewer people wanted to engage in the necessary blue-collar work of manufacturing or construction, or indeed, taking on any job featuring the so-called three Ks. Jobs that were considered kitanai, dirty, kiken, dangerous, or kitsui, demanding. These jobs, however, still needed to be filled. The economy couldn't be sustained without them. And as it became clearer that many local Japanese were unwilling to perform this work, corporations began to realize that they needed to look elsewhere. They needed to bring in gaijin workers from overseas. Let's change the image of Japanese people. Sure. However, the initial wave of manual laborers from Pakistan, Bangladesh, the Philippines, and Malaysia brought significant illegal immigration with them, leading Japanese authorities to see these foreign nationals as too different, too disruptive of the national wa, or harmony. But there was another option. If they needed manual laborers who could fit into Japanese legal and cultural frameworks, then why not recruit those wayward Japanese who had left Japan at the turn of the century. Why not bring back the Japanese Brazilians? The Japanese government looked towards the Japanese Brazilians as an acceptable source of labor because they were ostensibly Japanese. This was something the Japanese Brazilians themselves may well have agreed with. Yet by the 1980s, their community was truly entrenched in Brazilian culture, with a growing majority of the population having been born in Brazil itself or having Brazil-born parents or even a local Brazilian parent. 
Still, their grandparents and parents had maintained a strong connection to Japan by participating in overseas Japanese organizations and teaching their children about Japanese music, sports, and culture. These Oba-sans and Oji-sans told them stories of the homeland filled with nostalgia and longing. Many Japanese Brazilians, no matter how integrated into their native Brazilian culture, referred and still refer to themselves as some variant of Japanese, be it as Nikkeijin, a Japanese word meaning any person of Japanese descent who lives abroad, Nise, technically meaning second generation Japanese immigrants in Japanese but used by Brazilians to refer to their entire community, or simply by the Portuguese word for Japanese, Japonese. <laughs> Japan, via recruitment companies, began to reach out to these Nikkei Brazilians. And by the 1980s, many of them had good reasons to want to accept the invitation back to their cultural hearth. While the Brazil of the 1960s had seen its own economic miracle, unlike Japan, it had not been able to weather the global oil crises of the mid-1970s. And additional local political and economic instability had led to runaway inflation. Despite the comfortable middle-class lifestyle many Nikkei had previously obtained in Brazil, with layoffs and the local economy crumbling, the stable wages in Japanese manufacturing plants suddenly looked like a suitable port to wait out the storm. But Japan's own immigration laws stood in the way of the mass return migration it needed. While Issei, that is, first-generation Japanese immigrants to Brazil, were of course still Japanese citizens who could return and work as they liked, those born in Brazil, who were steadily becoming the market majority of Japanese Brazilians, were not so lucky. Nisei, that is, second generation, up to Sansei, third generation, born in Brazil, could receive citizenship if registered at a Japanese consulate within 30 days of their birth. However, most of their parents had failed to take advantage of this, leading to their children's Brazilian by birth nationality to become their sole citizenship. These Nisei and Sansei thus needed to overcome the hurdle of obtaining full-on visas to work, live, and travel within Japan, just like any non-Japanese person anywhere in the world. In the mid-80s, only a trickle of South Americans of Japanese descent managed to get the visas they needed to work in the homeland. Japanese officials knew action needed to be taken, and with surprising swiftness, taken it was. 1990 saw the passing of major immigration law reform aimed at privileging migrants with a blood connection to Japan, paving the way for easily obtained work visas for Nisei and Sansei to come and work in Japan in any job they could find, often three-year visas and one-year visas at a time for Nisei and Sansei respectively, seemingly showing a preference by Japanese officials for those with a more direct blood connection to Japan. The floodgates had opened. Each year from 1990 onwards, tens of thousands of Japanese Brazilians began the long journey to Japan in search of work. By 1998, there were 222,217 Brazilians living in Japan. More than one-sixth of the entire Japanese Brazilian population had migrated. This surged beyond 300,000 in the next decade, making Brazilians the third largest population of non-nationals in Japan after Chinese and Koreans, communities with their own unique histories and issues. Initially, most Brazilians had envisioned their sojourn in Japan as something temporary. They'd work hard, send money home, and then return to more prestigious work in Brazil. This earned them the title of Deikasegi, literally one who goes out to save money. These Deikasegi Japanese Brazilians came in the hundreds of thousands, filling roles in manufacturing plants throughout Japan's long Taiheo Belt, from Fukuoka in the south to Ibaraki on the border with the northern regions. Concentrating more strongly in the car manufacturing cities around Aichi Prefecture and neighboring Shizuoka in Gifu, these central Japanese cities saw their demographics changed almost overnight. 
Japanese communities in the cities surrounding Nagoya, for whom hearing snatches of Kansai or Mikawa dialect from their fellow riders of the Meitetsu line might have at one time seemed exotic, were suddenly exposed to a completely foreign language, flowing from otherwise Japanese-appearing commuters sitting next to them. Major growing pains commenced as plant workers saw foreigners who spoke in a strange tongue, which they soon came to know as Portuguese, and whose attitude towards work and propriety differed from their own, suddenly entering their workforce en masse. Entire neighborhoods near plants or construction sites became decidedly diverse, where once they had been almost completely homogenous. For some Japanese, this sudden change was simply too shocking. They packed up and moved leading these new Brazilian enclaves to become all the more isolated. The entire point of prioritizing the Japanese diaspora community's return migration over other more foreign groups had been because of perceived cultural similarities and shared Japanese-ness. But although Japanese Brazilians identified as Japanese themselves while in Brazil, they felt their identity shift as they came to realize that the Japanese around them saw them as gaijin, the derogatory slang term for foreigner. They may have been gaijin that looked Japanese, but were gaijin nonetheless. After all, most dekasegi are nisei or sansei, and while the nisei may speak Japanese, they often do not speak it perfectly in a hyojungo sense, that is, standardized Japanese. Indeed, many of their parents and grandparents came from regions of Japan with strong dialects that they passed on to their children. And the sansei likely only spoke small amounts of Japanese at home. Some of them were unable to hold full conversations in Japanese. Many interviews with Japanese Brazilian Dekasegi reveal an interesting inverse crisis of identity. In Brazil, they feel Japanese, but in Japan, they feel Brazilian. <laughs> A new desire to participate in Brazilian culture in Japan and to preserve Brazilianness amongst themselves and with the rest of the country has led to a mass celebration of South American culture. The Asakusa Samba Festival in Tokyo, for example, is perhaps the largest Brazilian style carnival outside of Rio de Janeiro. In towns like Toyohashi or Toyota or Gamagori in Aichi Prefecture, all of which have major Brazilian minorities, Brazilian flags hang from shop windows and apartment balconies. Major chains market to Degasegi with signs in Portuguese, and Brazilian Portuguese language schools offer education to the immigrant children, whom the Japanese school system often fails to properly account for and who fall through the cracks of public education in startling numbers. Something made worse because education is not compulsory for non citizen children in Japan. <laughs> The Japanese government's desire for a brotherly connection with like-minded Japanese of the diaspora has been seen by some Japanese Brazilians as misguided. In his book Brokered Homeland, Japanese Brazilian Migrants in Japan, Joshua Hotaka Roth, himself a second-generation Brazilian Nisei, suggested that the Japanese government's appeal towards the Nikkei communities has been one aimed at ijusha, a term that brings to mind first-generation immigrants, and their nostalgic and often patriotic feelings towards a Japan that they themselves left. Meanwhile, the returnees who are Nisei and beyond, and who struggle with the more pressing issues of poor wages, language difficulties, cultural integration, and huge rates of youth school absenteeism are ignored. So Japanese Brazilians continue to interact with Japanese society in both fruitful and perhaps counterintuitive ways. An interesting point being their religion. Brazilian Japanese are majority Catholic, and in the early waves of the return to Japan, local churches logically served as important communal spaces. But as the Brazilian community has developed other cultural organizations, newspapers, community groups, and more, the role of churches as unifiers has diminished. And although Brazilian Japanese may make up about half of all Catholics in Japan, their religious customs are distinctly Brazilian and take place in Portuguese which has limited their interaction with the broader Japanese Catholic community, which of course operates in Japanese. There are examples of Japanese and Brazilian Catholic groups that share the same church and yet never interact. Their masses and events take place at different times. 
Meanwhile, Brazilian Japanese immigrants have been seen as a potentially fertile source of new converts to so-called new religions, that is, Shinshukyo, a catch-all phrase used for the numerous and sometimes controversial religious and spiritual movements that have popped up in Japan over the past 150 years. Some of these new religions, such as Honmon Butsuryushu and Seicho no Ie, have in fact made major inroads into Brazil itself, picking up so many non-Japanese converts in that country, they have switched their main language of observance to Portuguese rather than their original Japanese. And since so many Japanese Brazilian Dekasegi spoke Portuguese themselves, what better target could these organizations have than ethnically Japanese Lusophones, that is, Portuguese speakers, many of which might find themselves needing a stronger sense of community in this foreign land, Japan. It could perhaps be considered amusing that according to some reports, these new religions have found more success in attracting Japanese Brazilian recruits than has the mainstream Japanese Catholic Church. So the years went by, and with more and more manufacturing plants relying on Brazilian labor, and the economic situation back in Brazil still uncertain, an increasing amount of Deikasegi began to choose to remain in Japan rather than return home as they originally planned. Ironically mirroring the lives of their ancestors, who had moved to Brazil with an eye of getting rich quick and going home, only to become the founders of a multi-generational community of over a million and a half people. After all, their jobs in Japan, no matter how demeaning for some, feature wages that are often 5 to 10 times what they would earn doing similar work back in Brazil. The huge flows of money they had been remitting back home began to sputter and slow to a trickle as more people began using those funds for their own lives in Japan. Now in the year 2020, the hundreds of thousands of Brazilians in Japan account for the largest Lusophone population in Asia, eclipsing the combined populations of Macau, East Timor, and the Indian state of Goa, all of which were under Portuguese control for hundreds of years. But fate and history abound with yet more ironies. The 2008-2009 economic crisis and the subsequent huge manufacturing crash, and with Japanese Brazilians still not fitting into the wa of society as previously envisioned, the Japanese government began looking for ways to incentivize the Deikasegi to once again return to Brazil. For a group whose ancestors were told to leave Japan when the economy was bad, only to be courted back when the economy was suddenly booming, this urged on second diaspora must be a hard pill to swallow. The Japanese government is offering ethnic Japanese South Americans free airfare and a gift of a few thousand dollars per dependent to return from whence they most recently came, leading many cash-strapped and laid-off plant workers between a rock and a hard place. I have no idea of job. I'm going back to the and perhaps more shockingly of all, the stipulation for accepting this return aid is extremely high. Anyone wishing to accept must promise to never return to Japan again on such a work visa. The Japanese Brazilians have become something akin to immigrant celebrities, and seem to endlessly fascinate their mainland cousins. Let's take a look at some interesting questions asked regarding Nikkei Buddha Jirajin on Yahoo Chiebukuro, the Japanese version of Yahoo Answers. Don't they have any desire to study the Japanese language? In this case, responders logically explained that language or cultural acquisition is not the main reason most Dekasegi come to Japan. Is it just my imagination that Nikkei Brazilians don't seem to often mix races with black people? Responders explain that this is not necessarily racism on the Nikkei's part, but perhaps because of the demographics of southern Brazil. When we speak of marriage, he says that the process would be too hard. This is a case in which a Japanese woman with a Nikkei Brazilian boyfriend of 8 years, whom she had a child with, complains that her otherwise supportive partner refuses to marry, and responders imply he likely has a wife back in Brazil. Facing attitudes like this, it's no surprise that many Japanese Brazilians don't want to stick around. Wellington Shibuya, a Japanese Brazilian who lived in Japan for six years as a Dekasegi, had this to say to the New York Times on the matter. 
They put up with us as long as they needed the labor, but now that the economy is bad, they throw us a bit of cash and say goodbye. We worked hard, we tried to fit in, yet they're so quick to kick us out. I'm happy to leave a country like this. But still, a majority of Japanese Brazilians have managed to stay in Japan, even if dwindling numbers have seen arrivals from both the Philippines and Vietnam overtake them in Japanese demographics. The road has been a bumpy one and currently trends towards filling those 3K jobs by hiring Southeast Asian workers on often controversial and abused trainee program visas has shifted focus away from the reuniting of long-lost Japanese diaspora populations with Japan. But Japanese Brazilians will continue to make up a vibrant, vital part of Japanese society whose tale, one of leaving for distant shores, and returning as something new will continue to inspire, no matter how hard their homeland attempts to see them leave yet again. Alright everybody, thank you for watching. I hope this proved an interesting look at the story of one of Japan's most intriguing and vibrant communities. I really enjoyed putting these videos together and also greatly appreciated the comments from members of the Japanese Brazilian community and those close to them that I received on the previous video. I hope this two-part series has done them justice and that it has also helped more people to come to know their story. I'll be back again soon with more histories from Unseen Japan. So if you like what you heard, like, comment, and subscribe, and check out our main website at unseenjapan.com. And maybe even give us a bit of support over on Patreon. Members get exclusive articles, early access, and a bunch of other fun stuff. And your support goes a long way in helping us continue to put out new content. I'll be back soon, so until then, atelogu, and matane.